Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to be talking about cervical myelopathies. We're first going to talk about what they are and what can cause them, and then we'll go into the risk factors, and then we'll talk about the signs and symptoms. So first of all, a cervical myelopathy is really when you have impingement on the spinal cord in the cervical spine due to an obstruction of the vertebral canal in that region. So let's take a look at this anatomy over here. So over here on the left side of this picture, you have the anterior structures. These are all the vertebral bodies, right? You have C7, C6, 5, 4, 3. Here's 2, the axis with that large odontoid process sticking up, right? Back here, we have the posterior tubercle of C1, and then from here down to the bottom, we have the spinous processes of C2 down through C7. And in between the anterior and posterior structures, we have the vertebral canal, and then within that, we've got this orangish tan structure that goes down here, which is, of course, the spinal cord. And we said that a cervical myelopathy occurs any time there's a compression by any structure onto the spinal cord. Well, we can see several structures within here that can cause that compression or impingement. Right here's the first one. So this is actually the ligamentum flavum. That's all what this yellow stuff is right here, posteriorly. And sometimes you can have hypertrophy of that ligamentum flavum. Here's hypertrophy of it right here. Normally it should be kind of this thinner structure, but you can see it's really fat right there. That's hypertrophy. It can even hypertrophy and ossify, as you see down here. And in both cases, notice it's taking up more space than it ought to, and it's producing this compression on the spinal cord. On the posterior surface of these vertebral bodies right here, we have the posterior longitudinal ligament, or the PLL. Down here, you actually see hypertrophy of that posterior longitudinal ligament. So again, it's hypertrophied, it's taking up more space than it ought to, and it's producing some compression on the spinal cord right here. Again, here you see ossification of that same ligament, and in this area right here, we actually see the PLL has become dissociated from the C4 vertebral body. Again, it's protruding posteriorly, and it's producing some compression on the spinal cord right there. Right here, we see a posteriorly protruding intervertebral disc between C4 and C5. That's, of course, having that compression on the spinal cord as well. Here we're looking at an MRI. This is a sagittal view. We can see the pons up here. Here's the medulla. And then down here is the spinal cord, right? And we see right here, there's this black structure. So something is taking up space there where it shouldn't be, right? And we see that thinning of the spinal cord right here because whatever this is, is compressing the spinal cord. Now you've got the vertebral bodies over here. So this is anterior. Uh, this is more posterior on the right side of the picture. So most likely what this is, is hypertrophy or ossification of the ligaments of flame. It may not be but that's a good a bet of what it might be and it's producing that compression on the spinal cord really between C5 and C6. And so the risk factors here are really anything that narrow the vertebral canal and cause that impingement on the spinal cord. The first risk factor is cervical spondylosis. If we go back here, uh, spondylosis is really this fancy term for age-related degeneration of the spine. And so when we get spondylosis, oftentimes the disc becomes desiccated, it dries out, the disc flattens, and we get these vertebral uh, bodies coming closer and closer together. That can cause the disc to move out posteriorly. In general, when we have spondylosis, it does produce a little bit of narrowing of that vertebral canal. So that's one risk factor. And along the lines of age-related degeneration, also just simply being older is a risk factor itself. So being at least 50 or 60 years old is a risk factor for a cervical myelopathy. Now, as you might imagine, any trauma to the neck is going to be a risk factor. And two of the major traumas that you can have are motor vehicle accidents, where you can obviously have a head and neck injury, or a sports injury, particularly in contact sports like martial arts or football or rugby, things like that. You could also imagine a fall. If you fell just right, uh, you could potentially damage something in this vertebral canal causing impingement on the spinal cord. And then another risk factor here is rheumatoid arthritis. So RA is associated with weakening of the atlanoaxial interval, so between C1 and C2. Several of the ligaments that exist in there that we don't actually see here become weak, and it can cause um, abnormal movement of the atlas relative to the axis. And so when that happens, you can get compression on the spinal cord way up there between C1 and C2. 
Note that rheumatoid arthritis is not the only condition where you can have that ligamentous weakening. You also see it in Down syndrome and many other conditions. It just so happens that rheumatoid arthritis is the most common of those. So those are your risk factors for cervical myelopathy. Now let's take a look at the signs and symptoms. And let's think about this logically. We're compressing the spinal cord way up in the cervical spine. So this is above the thoracic spinal cord and below the lumbosacral uh, nerves and spinal cord, right? And so that means we're probably going to have symptoms all over in the upper and lower extremities. So the first one here is neck and upper extremity pain. In general, the upper extremity symptoms are going to be a little bit worse than the lower extremity symptoms. Some of the big observations you might see are weakness and sensory impairments. And in general, most of these things are going to be more severe in the upper extremities than they are in the lower extremities, although they probably will be present in both. Now, we also have lower motor neuron and upper motor neuron signs. The lower motor neuron signs are going to be present at the level of the lesion. So if we imagine this uh, myelopathy here between C6 and C7 right there, well, above that, there's not going to be any issues, right? because you're not going to have issues above the level of the myelopathy. Now, at the level of this myelopathy, which is probably going to be the C7 nerve root because that exits below C6, that's where you're going to see severe weakness, but also hyporeflexia. Okay, so if we think about the C7 uh, myotome, that's going to control the triceps, among other things. And for reflex, it's the triceps reflex. So we would probably expect to see hyporeflexia um, for the C7 reflex and also some weakness in elbow extension. And that would be pretty severe weakness because we're right at that level. But then as we go below the level of the myelopathy, that's where we start to see upper motor neuron signs. So you can imagine that the vast majority of the levels of the spinal cord are going to be upper motor neuron signs. And those might include spasticity. We're going to see probably a lot of hyperreflexia below this level. So we might expect to see a patellar hyperreflexia, Achilles hyperreflexia, and someone with a myelopathy at this level. Okay? We might also see clonus, might see Babinski reflexes, inverted supinator sign, Hoffman sign. We can see any of those. Okay? Um, paresthesias with weakness and wasting in the hands. You tend to see weakness more distally, particularly in the hands with a cervical myelopathy. So you might see atrophy of the thenar eminence, weakness in grip, clumsiness with um, hand movement coordination and, and fractionated movement, and also the sensory changes like paresthesias, numbness, tingling, pins and needles, that kind of stuff. Gait disorders. Typically when they walk, they'll walk in with an ataxic gait, very uncoordinated, and have a wider base of support in order to maintain balance due to that uh, incoordination or discoordination. They may also have bowel and bladder dysfunction and also sexual dysfunction not put there. Uh, those are some things that strongly rule up conditions like a cervical myelopathy or we saw in another video called equina syndrome. And because the myelopathy most of the time is going to affect the posterior columns of the spinal cord. You'll also see loss of deep touch, vibration, and joint position sense. And they may also present with Lermit's sign. What you might also see in people with cervical myelopathy would be a positive Sperling's test and also a distraction test. Although those are not specific for cervical myelopathy, those could be a number of things, but just watch out, those can be positive as well. Now here we see a test item cluster for cervical myelopathy. We have five things included that were found to be the most predictive. Those are gait deviation, Hoffman's test, inverted supinator sign, Babinski test, and just being older than 45 years. Now of course there's a lot of other things that they can present with. So the rule is if none or only one of these five are positive, then you have a negative likelihood ratio of 0.18 and you can rule out a cervical myelopathy. But if you have three or more of these that are positive, then you rule in cervical myelopathy because three or more of these is associated with a positive likelihood ratio of 30.9. That's a pretty darn high ratio. Normally, if the positive likelihood ratio is 10, we would say that it's a pretty good positive predictor. So 30.9 is kind of like off the charts. Okay. So if somebody comes in and they're older than 45, let's say they're 55 years old, they have a positive gait deviation test and a positive Hoffman test, 
even if three and four here are negative, that's three of them that are positive, and so now you really have to strongly consider a cervical myelopathy, okay? Now, what about the conservative treatment for a cervical myelopathy? Well, probably the thing to start with would be intermittent cervical traction. And you can see some parameters right here. It may depend on a lot of other factors. But you're going to do traction of the cervical spine. So you can see here about 16 to 24 pounds of force for 15 to 20 minutes. And remember that when you do intermittent cervical traction, you have the neck in a little bit of flexion. Here it says about 24 degrees of cervical flexion. And it's going to be intermittent traction. And if you want more information on that process, go back and watch the video that I have on my channel. Just search intermittent traction. And believe it or not, you can also do manipulations. But generally speaking, these manipulations are not targeted at the neck. They're targeted at the thoracic spine. Okay? So the first one here is just a general upper thoracic traction manipulation. And then the second one here is a mid-thoracic manipulation. So it's been shown that for people with neck pain, that thoracic manipulations can be effective in reducing that pain. Now, one thing to mention about any of these manipulations is that by themselves, uh, they are not really effective. They have to be combined with specific exercises targeting the patient's symptoms to have any real effect. And then second, these are probably last on your list to do. We're talking about somebody with a compression on their cervical spinal cord. And so you would need to be very, very careful with these and be pretty skilled before you attempt these on someone with a cervical myelopathy. Okay. The third manipulation here is what's called a traction manipulation of the cervical spine. This one's not on the thoracic spine, and what's important is this is not a rotational manipulation of the cervical spine. Usually when you see a neck manipulation, it's the rotational kind. You would never do that on someone with a cervical myelopathy. The traction one is literally just a distraction. It's a distraction of the cervical spine in the axial direction. Okay, it's not rotational. But again, probably your first choice is going to be to do this intermittent cervical traction plus specific therapeutic exercises that target the patient's signs and symptoms. Okay, so hopefully this video will give you a good understanding of what a cervical myelopathy is, the risk factors, signs and symptoms, and then also uh, the treatment. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.